Today, a few provocations from the Hannah Arendt I have most recently read. Welcome to Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. You know, I say a few provocations. I can't guarantee I'm going to finish this in one episode, but you're going to hope that I do. This is definitely a show that caters to my inclinations. So, but I think it'll be very interesting. Uh, and not, uh, not, so if you'll bear with it, I think it can be really helpful for all of us to have individually an opportunity to examine ourselves and how well we're doing at taking our lives and applying them in the world uh, the way that we can and the way that I think God expects us to. So I I think it will be worth the journey if you can hang with me to get through it. And I will say about Hannah Arendt as we're we're speaking, you know, I've I've read a lot of stuff uh, from her. I've talked about each piece as I've read it uh, with, uh, you know, in some of these episodes, I just can't avoid it. I mean, it's so compelling and uh, clear and necessary. And anyway, if you've not started reading her yet, you know, get with it. Uh, how do I say it? And this work would not be the one I would first recommend for you, by the way. It's, it's, a, it's dense. It's more difficult to get through than most of the others for people who are not already either familiar with her or with the language of the humanities and all the stuff that goes with that. But eh, I'm not, not worried about that. But I would say in today's political climate, especially as divisive as it is, as apocalyptically as we describe it, and all of those attributes of today's political climate, they merit a familiarity with someone who lived through the Holocaust and then through the Cold War or into the middle of the Cold War and maintained a reasoned, commonsensically communicated, but also brilliant uh, clarity in her understanding of what was going on and her analysis of how we ought to think about it. And so if you want to interact in common sense terms with one of the most prescient minds of the 20th century, she's your opportunity to do it. So I strongly encourage you to do so. Plus, I have to give a a nod to an alum uh, of Criswell College, you know, and, and a former student of mine, thanks to James Edmonds, uh, for the prompt to read this particular book. I haven't, I, I had not picked up this book yet and read it. I would have eventually because I'm reading everything by Hannah Arendt. But uh, he picked it up and read it after I, I had talked about Hannah Arendt some. And uh, in doing so, provoked me to want to read it. And I also just thank him for provoking me on a lot of issues. He stays, we have conversations every once in a while uh, he's a graduate from a while back who went on from here, got a law degree, and is working in the Dallas uh, District Attorney's Office. And uh, it's just a, you know, a really smart guy and, and a good thinker. And every once in a while, we get to have a supper together and we talk about stuff. And he keeps me more abreast, I think, of contemporary ideas politically and philosophically. And every once in a while, I can point him back to something, uh, you know, in the older world. Uh, that might uh, help him think about things as well. So it's a lot of fun. But uh, thanks to thanks to James Edmonds for uh, getting me into this book in particular. So anyway, the point today is to talk about, I mean, this is going to sound silly at first, but hopefully it'll make sense, but to talk about what it means not just to be human, but to do the things that it is to be human, which is a really involved idea. And because God creates us, not just to be neutral, not, not as just part of the landscape, but he creates us and gives us assignments, responsibilities, tasks, whatever words we want to put on it, and we'll put some specific ones on it later, not the same ones I just used. Um, you know, how to be that and do those things in the way 
that God really wants us to do them. But to get there, I want to use an analogy first, not from the book that I'm talking about, and which is called The Human Condition, and not, uh, not from the actual application that we'll talk about in a few minutes, but just something similar to it, related to it, about the way we think of ourselves as human beings. And so, uh, and you know, if I just say, you know, what are you as a human being? What does it mean for you to be a human being? Uh, then we think of a body and a soul. And some of us think as trichotomists, you know, body, soul, and spirit, or or something along those lines. But as Christians, not everybody I know who listens to this is a Christian, but, you know, as people in the Christian tradition, and even philosophically in the Western tradition, uh, we at least have the categories available to think of a human body and a human soul, or to think of body and mind, or, you know, all those different ways of putting the categories. We can, we'll put it some of those ways in a minute. But there are some traditions that strip those two things apart in one way or another, that strip the human being as a soul from the shell it inhabits at the moment, for instance, as a body. So the one that would do that, uh, most obviously, would be eliminative materialism, which, by which I just mean, you know, a materialism, a belief that only matter exists. That's the only thing that's real. Uh, and therefore eliminate the prospect that anything else could actually be real. So that kind of a philosophy or a view of the world, eliminative materialism, in whatever form it would take, whatever iteration it would take, would strip the soul out of the body. Just say all you have is a body. That's all that you really are. So, for instance, one, one way of doing that would be to say, well, man's just a machine. And so just like every other physical process, we're just a really complex form of physical processes and we're like a fountain or like a, you know, lava flow or whatever it would be. And, but it's really complex and you have these little things that look like they're thinking, but they're just machines that are functioning inside of you. Or you could take a step forward from that and think of us as just really well-developed animals. And yeah, animals have something alive in them that goes beyond the mineral world but we're no more than just super complicated, complex animals like, uh, you know, primates that happen to also function at a slightly higher level. And so we have language as well and so on. There's that way of thinking about it. And, uh, you know, I, I think in that case, a, a lot of times uh, people might think the mind is something parallel to uh, like a rainbow after a rainstorm. You know, it looks for all the world like it's there, and it's a real thing, but if you go there, there's nothing there. There's there, there's not anything really there. It's just a, a function of the physical things that are actually there. It's, it's something like that uh, with the human mind and the body for people who think those ways. But some Christians do the same thing. It's not all this deep, by the way, philosophic. Not that that was deep philosophy, but you know what I mean. I'm not going to be this... Uh, I don't even know which word to use, ethereal, uh, esoteric, I don't know. But I'm not going to be that through the whole thing. So hang with me through this part, if you will, for just a minute. Even right now, I think it'll be a little more applied for some of you who are not as interested in the philosophical side of it, or at least not interested in those details of the philosophical side. I mean, let's be honest. If you listen to this podcast, you're... You know, even if you don't like to admit it, you've got to be somewhat interested in philosophy or you would have kicked me like a football a long time ago. Anyway, I don't know why I said football. I'm not a football. I wouldn't want to be kicked that way. The point is that in the same way that an eliminative materialist strips the soul out of the body and only leaves the body, some Christians do the same thing, but just sort of in the opposite direction. So there are some traditions you know, uh, at least on the side of Christianity, sort of near Christianity, their heresies or side notions or influences that are temporary within Christianity, whatever, Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, Manichaeanism, Manichaeism, that do the same kind of thing that sort of say, well, look, we have a body, but it's, you know, it's just, it's just this temporary thing. And it, it's not even a real thing or it would last forever and it's not going to last forever. So we really want to discard that and become the non-material, soulish, eternal thing 
that Plato describes the ideas as and so on, and that's what really matters. But, you know, that that's the same kind of deficiency and the same kind of problem. And, and the reason I'm describing those as deficient or problematic is because the Christian image, both in Scripture and stubbornly throughout church history, it always comes back to this, is of the integral nature of being human, that we're not one or the other, we're both, and that it's not appropriate to think of one as good and the other as bad. And even in saying that, I know some of you are pausing to go, well, the flesh is kind of bad right now. But that's not about the body in contrast to the soul. There's nothing in Scripture that's saying, well, because you have this ugly body, you have to lug around the world. We're still bound by sin. Sin's in our souls. It's not in our corporeal cells. Uh, The problem with us is not that we have a material being. So our tendency to fall into Gnostic or Neoplatonist or Manichaean thinking about how the material world might be the source of evil or something, that kind of dualism, uh, sort of, it, it, it still hangs with us, even though, again, Scripture and church history both testify that we can't separate the two. We're, we're integral. We're, we're, we're physical and non-physical, physical and spiritual. Uh, so, yeah, we, of course we can speak of having a body, but we can also speak of having a soul. The gist is that when we have both, it means we're finally human. Uh, Genesis 2-7, the way it describes it, I think fits this and expresses what how we're supposed to think of ourselves as human beings. The Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Of course, I know that air and breathing is material also. It just happens to be invisible, but that's not how they see the world. The word breath and the word spirit are the same word in Hebrew, and it's because the the, the, the wind, just like Jesus talks about it in John 3, the wind, the air is this invisible force in a way that metaphorically allows us to understand what a spirit is. It's a real thing, even if we can't see it, even if we don't see it directly or interact with it directly, it does move the things around us and it changes the things around us. And so it's a way for us to understand that non-material part of our being. So metaphorically, this is making the point we want to make. So the Lord God formed the man of the hard stuff, the dust of the ground, the material stuff, and then breathed into his nostrils the invisible stuff. The immaterial stuff is the implication, through the metaphor, into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became then a nephesh, a living creature, a living soul, however, whatever word you want to put on it. That's what made us the whole thing that we are, and it's in that whole thing that we are that we exist as human beings. So in applied, you know, if if you make this practical in applied terms, and again, this is just the analogy for the topic I want to bring up with you. So this is just to get the groundwork laid. In applied terms, talking about the human body and soul as needing to be integrated for us to be one being. I'm not a soul that has to live in a body. I'm not a body that happens to have this thing fluttering around inside of me. I'm both, and I'm both at the same time, and therefore I am who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm an integrated whole, in a, and that doesn't mean I don't believe in a body, soul, and spirit. I do, by the way, so you know, I'm, I'm still a trichotomist in that way for, for people who think in those terms, but a dualist metaphysically. Anyway, I got to keep moving. So in applied terms, our confusion about you know the body and the soul and whether they are the same thing or separate things or separable or whatever— our confusion sometimes shows up in how we think, like, and when I say our confusion in this case, I mean it particularly in the direction where we think we're a soul and we just happen to have a body right now. I think that confusion shows up in the way we talk about our brains because we very often substitute our brains for a mind as if, it, as if a brain is a mind in the same way we were able to substitute breath for a spirit a minute ago. So we use the brain to, to, to sort of hold that place for us. And then we act as if the brain is where all of our experiences really happen because we're sort of taught that's the way it is. That's the center of our experience. 
and that's where all your thoughts are being had and so on. And it makes sense for us to say that because it is in some way uniquely connected to our consciousness. We know how quickly we're going to lose consciousness, you know, if we don't have a brain. That's, that's, that's true. That's fair. You're also very quickly going to lose consciousness if you don't have a heart, by the way. But, but we feel like that's kind of for a different reason, and I, I understand that. But we will say things that imply that you only feel things in your head. Like, well, that's all, you know, even, even when you have pain, of course, all that only happens in your head. That's only happening in your brain. It's only happening what we really mean in your mind. I get why all that's true in a sense, but it's also completely false. I never feel anything in my brain. It doesn't even have any nerve endings. I feel things in my finger, for instance, when I touch a table. I don't feel it and go, ooh, that's hitting just next to my temple. Uh, I feel the table, and it's my finger that says, hey, stop doing that quite so hard, you know? I'm getting a response in my body. Some of the psychological experiences that patients of amputation have sort of emphasize this point. And I've got, you know, I, I mean, I wrote down a few quotations from this study. I took a glance at Daisy can create a link to it. It's not, it's not that interesting a study, but I mean, it's, it, it is, it is sort of interesting just to consider this, that when people lose a part of their body, there is something dramatic about that psychologically. I'm not saying it's true for everybody. It's at different levels and different causes and consequences of the amputation also bring about different levels to all of that. It's all mentioned in that study. But the point is, people don't just say, huh, well, I'm down one finger, you know, like I lost my, uh, you know, that, that shirt I really liked. There's something different about losing a part of your body, and it's uh, disconcerting in some ways. I mean, some people are, uh, I will read you one or two of these. I mean, one is, uh, I was awaking from the induced coma, uh, induced coma. It was like a nightmare. I couldn't move. I wanted to get away. It was terrible. I felt like I was in prison. I couldn't run. I could see my right hand, but I was missing my left hand. Why? And for a moment, I just wanted to die and, and pray, God, take me, Lord. I cannot live with this. And another one, well, I thought the sky was falling. I may start crying. I didn't want to talk to anybody because they lost a part of their body. Another, at first, I said, no, I refused to have the amputation, even though they were going to die. I refused to have the amputation, and I thought I'd rather die. I even told the doctor, I'd rather die than lose my leg. That's not an uncommon sentiment. And so, I, and, and it's because, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say it's because. It seems evident that it would be naturally related to how closely we identify our being with our physical being. And why wouldn't we? I mean, I'm sitting in a room, and I, I, I don't think my soul is a physical thing. My soul doesn't need to be in one place or another. But I'm pretty sure my soul is in this room with me because my body's in the room. It's what my eyes are seeing and my hands are feeling. And so it's impossible for me to extract all that together. And for, you know, if you do think to yourself, well, I'm not going to have that argument. The point is body, soul, all tied together. We are holistic beings. Okay. In making that case, I think, uh, by the way, I, I'll throw this in here because we do this also. If we do make a distinction between the two, and, and you do, it makes sense to distinguish between a body and a soul. A body is material. Its primary attribute is extension. It takes up space over time. And a soul is not material. Its primary attribute is thought. It doesn't take up any space over any period of time. So it, it doesn't make sense to think of them as the same thing. I think separating all that's just Cartesian, by the way. I'm not making it up. It's not new to me. It's Descartes. But the point is, if you distinguish between the two, you have to be careful not to make a moral distinction between the two. Like one is better than the other. The soul is better than the body. And that's normal for us. We think of the soul as being better than the body, but that's a mistake. Theologically, anthropologically, and philosophically, you know, it's just a mistake. There's a reason for it. I understand why we do it, but it is a mistake. By the way, I, I probably won't come back to this later, so I'll say it right now. The evidence that it's a mistake is in the importance of the resurrection. The, the Gospels don't end with 
an ethereal existence in heaven. The Gospels end with a resurrection of the dead from the grave, the bodies being brought back to life. To God, it matters that our physical being is brought back into the fullness of what it was supposed to be, not by itself, but with us being completed in that. And so the resurrection is testimony. We can't, we can't just act like, well, the soul's all good, the body's all bad. The soul is as fallen as the body is in this system that we have. And so what the evidence that we do that, though, that we do morally sort of disdain our bodies in some way, uh, shows up in some really practical ways, like ignoring the body uh, or treating it with disdain. So asceticism, which I doubt very many of us experience, uh, we're pretty prosperous and we're pretty inclined to to do whatever we want to do. So most of us are not denying ourselves and fasting for two weeks at a time or refusing ever to eat anything enjoyable again uh, and so on. Very few people do that. I've known a few who do things like that. And, and it's not inherently built into asceticism, by the way. There are lots of reasons to do that. There's just some uh, lesser forms of self-discipline that might include that. Paul even talks about those things. Anyway, the point is, asceticism as a conviction, like I can't enjoy anything in my body. It would be a terrible thing to indulge any of the desires of my body you know, is a way of saying my soul is inherently morally superior to my body. The opposite side of that, by the way, is when people neglect the, the, the disciplines that go with having a healthy body out of, out of sheer, and I guess neglect is the only good word I can come up with. It's, it's out of sheer neglect because they just don't think it's important. Look, my, my spiritual existence isn't about my body, so who cares whether I'm eating food or not or what kind of food I'm eating or whether I'm exercising or not. I'm not going to waste my time at the gym. I've got to spend my time praying. Well, praying is great. That's important, and I'm not going to mitigate that in any way whatsoever. But thinking that discipline of the Spirit is the only discipline that matters and that you know, it is distinct from anything to do with the body is a mistake. And there are, I could just, I mean, I could name them one after another. I'm not going to name any of them, but many, many spiritual leaders over the decades and centuries who have been owned by their, in one case, obesity, in other cases, just being completely unhealthy. Obesity happens to be a a visible form of some kind of unhealth in some cases. And, uh, you know, in other cases, somebody can be really unhealthy and not take care of themselves at all and look perfectly good to other people. But I've known lots of spiritual leaders who did nothing to care for their physical body. And that's not, that's not, a, that's not, a, that's not taking care of yourself. That's not the same as self-discipline. There is a difference. I, I mean, I acknowledge that. Paul says it in 1 Timothy 4. The bodily training is of some value, but godliness is of a value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. But that doesn't, he's not just saying bodily training like, you know, doing exercise only has value for a little while. Doing exercise only for the sake of the body only lasts as long as the body lasts until there's a resurrection, obviously. So, you know, it's going to die with your body. So that's his point. The body does perish. But the self-discipline that involves us being whole human beings does include us caring about our bodies as well as our souls. And it doesn't mean you have to serve your body uniquely or only or solely or that it becomes something you worship any more than you worship your own soul. Uh, But it's, it's really funny how we subjugate that and treat it as if it is completely unimportant, even though it's a part of who we are and what we're offering to God in service to him. Anyway, the integration of the two, the body and the soul, it goes beyond matter and form. That's what I've been talking about. It goes beyond body-mind. That's what I've been talking about, or the flesh and the spirit. In Scripture, and this is the part we want to get to, now we're about to begin. In, in Scripture, the inherent, there's an inherent relationship, and this makes us uncomfortable because of what we've been taught for so long. In sort of a, It's sort of a pop 
I, you know, I hate to, to attack anything, so I'm not, I'm not going to try to put it in one category or another, but it's just been a popular movement to try to talk about how important it is that we stop trying to do everything and we just try to be the person God wants us to be. And I, I value, I, I get what was, what was going on there. The too much busyness, too much just doing and living out of the need to accomplish things and to have people pat you on the back for it, or, you know, the workaholic syndrome and things like that. I'm saying syndrome, like it's some psychological, I'm, I don't mean that like it has a diagnosis, but you know what I mean? The whole set of features that went along with the term being a workaholic. There's there, I get why people focused on this, but in scripture, there is an inherent relationship between the human's being and doing. And I mean, I, I, there are many examples of this, but one I brought up not too long ago when we were talking about Psalm 139 in some episode that we did a while back. And Daisy can link to the episode. Uh, and it was, you know, it was, it was on life. I mean, that's why we brought it up. So it was some, sometime in January or something like that, probably. But in, in that Psalm, Psalm 139, he brings up this statement, your eyes saw my unformed substance, which is such a great term. You know, it's the Gollum term when, when you use that in Israel's history and uh, in Jewish tradition. It's this, you know, being, that, you know, that you, that, that's created out of material stuff but doesn't have a soul of its own, doesn't have a form of its own, so to speak. So that's this word. This is the only time it shows up in the Bible, I think. Anyway, the point is, in Psalm 139, it says this in verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed substance, so my incomplete being, I mean, this, this thing that I was going to be, but I wasn't yet, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So the, the golem that I am, the unformed, you know, material of which you'll make my being, that's not just my physical being in the, you know, in the womb. That's me as a whole human being being formed toward the days that God has given to me, the days that were formed for me. The, the implication of that is, you know, by the time God gives form to the formless, it's whole, uh, you know, it, 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 the, the whole being is what he has in mind. That's what he has in purview. So the days, when it says, you know, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, the days are the circumstances and accomplishments and opportunities and everything that goes with the circumstance of life, with the being from day to day. And, it, and by the way, it may or may not imply determinism. It's just not, it's not stated there. I'm not a determinist. I don't read it that way. So I might live up to them or might not. I might live, you know, fully within them or not. I don't know. But I know what he's forming for me, and he knows what he's forming for me, and all of that's in his mind from the very beginning. The point of that is he's describing this about uh, not just, you know, it, it's not just you've given me a being, and you want me to exist, but you've given me a context, a circumstance in which you want things to unfold in a certain way. You want me to be and do, and you've laid out all of that for me. And that's what I, it's, you know, the same thing that's going on in Philippians when he talks about the works that God has created for us. So in Revelation 20, I I mean, it's so obvious, it's so on the nose it's almost embarrassing to bring it up as if you'll say, well, who doesn't know that? Of course, I know, but I'm just going to say it anyway. When we're judged, what are we judged for? And so, you know, they were judged, every one of them, according to their being. No, we weren't. And it's really funny how we, in some of our theological precision, really want to push it in that direction. Well, are you or aren't you? And I get it. I get it. There's a reason to bring that up because the question of whether we're redeemed or not is the only valid question Uh, because everybody who's judged in this way that I'm about to describe is condemned. They're all condemned. But why? Because they're all judged the same way. They were judged, every one of them, according to what they had done. The doing matters. It is an essential part 
of who we are. The eternal reality of these souls is defined by what they had done. Our aversion to that language, because we just don't want to think about works, because our salvation is dependent on grace, and our works are never sufficient to bring about our salvation. But Christ's works are sufficient to bring about our salvation, and his work and our salvation is sufficient to bring about a transformation of our works, by the way. That's just a side note. The point for this discussion is that we have to examine ourselves if we want to stand before God on a daily basis or at the end of time and say, yes, I gave you all that I am. We have to consider both the being and doing that it is to be human, that it is for us to be the human that he called us to be. And so that's what I want to pursue. That's what I want to ask for us to consider. So here, uh, the basic point is that we sometimes have a tendency to abstract being from doing in humans the same way we abstract the soul from the body in humans, you know, and act like the soul is the important part and the body is not. We act like, well, being is important, but doing, that's not so important. And I, I think extracting being from doing in humans is like trying to abstract presence from location in physics. I mean, theoretically, you can, you can conceive of it. You know, this thing is present, but it's not present in any specific location. I mean, I understand we can use language about that, you know, like that about quantum physics, but quantum physics is all math. It's not, th th those are not models of being like we can conceive of the universe. So I can conceive of that, but it doesn't mean anything. So in the same way that presence has to go with being somewhere, if I'm present, I'm present somewhere. Presence and location go together, I'm saying. Then if we're if we exist as a being, we are a being that's doing something. And so, but then we have to figure out what it means to be doing. Uh, you know, what, what is it that we're doing? What, what is the kind of stuff that we're doing? So most importantly, I just want to clarify a couple of things. Most importantly, I definitely do not mean by this, man, you better get busy. Uh, it's not busyness. It's not just, let's go do something because our lives aren't worth anything if we're not doing something. That, that, that's not at all what I mean by this. Uh, this that, and, and a lot of us do, I, I mean, this is natural for a lot of us. I, I probably, I do have a tendency to do this. Uh, and that is, you know, we do that, we get busy, we just put our hands to something, Sudoku, you know, if nothing else, in order to avoid important emotions or questions of identity or critical relational moments, you know. So, well, I think we need to have a serious talk. Oh, oh, wait, let, let, let's go mow the yard. You know, anything to keep from having to have that serious critical conversation or whatever. So I, I think, you know, by doing what you do have to do with it, first of all, just don't make it busyness. But then secondly, recognize that there's a lot more to doing than just general activity. I think we can divide it into separate components. I know we can. Uh, this is part of the benefit of having read this book that I was talking about, The Human Condition, just recently. This is what it provoked in me. Wow, I haven't done this enough. And I certainly haven't talked about it with others. And so, you know, we can divide our doing into these separate components just so we understand what we're involved in and what that involvement means for us, what it means for our relationships, what it means for our purpose, uh, for our discipleship, ultimately, is what I want it to get to. And so in an analogy with classical physics, like I was talking about a minute ago, it would be, and I've said this in my modern world class, which is just a way of understanding how we, you know, in the modern world uh, class is an enlightenment class. It's what changed in our view of the world, you know, in the 17th, 18th centuries around then. 
and part of it was our understanding of classical physics changed. We we started to grasp the world as forces and things like that. And uh, one of the things that uh, emerged in that was a model of the universe in which everything is particles in motion. That's that's how it is. And I, I always have to help the students think through the idea that you can't conceive of a particle without conceiving of that particle in some state. Particles never just exist. They always exist in some state. For instance, it's never just there. It's there or over there. And it's never just, it's never just being. It's, it's moving or it's still. So particles exist in a state. So if you want to understand an object, for instance, you don't just need to know its mass. You need to know its mass and its velocity. Just talking classical physics here. That's And by the way, again, if you want to talk quantum physics, fine, but those are just models, mental models of mathematical ideas that are not conceivable in the terms that we would use to create proper analogies for, for human life, the way we live it. I, we can have a long conversation about that one if you disagree with what I just said, but I'm going to stand by it. Anyway, uh, that'll be a conversation for another day. So what I want to do is, out of the book, take the way we can divide human doing into labor, work, and action. Those are the sort of classical ways of dividing it, and especially in Hannah Arendt, the division between labor and work becomes particularly important, but between those and action also. So you get three different categories. And so what I want to do right now is just kind of explain the three categories very briefly, succinctly and then leave us with an opportunity to come back and talk about each of these three categories because they are distinct and easily separable, and they give us a handy way to look at ourselves and say, am I, am I, am I participating in that and giving that back to God? Uh, or or is it ju- am I ignoring it altogether, or am I using it purely selfishly? Or am I seeing it as, as something just to be discarded? rather than for the value it actually has. All of these things have value. They're a part of what it means to be human and to be a human that's actually living, that's doing things. And so if we're going to give ourselves to God, we need to give all of this to God. Neither pretend that it isn't there, nor pretend that it's discardable. And so one of them is labor. And again, I'm just going to say right now what they are, and then next episode we'll talk about the the three separately, but you know, labor. So is, uh, so this is, this will sound, I I think it'll make sense to you, you know, labor. So why would we separate labor and work? This is a big part of her writing in the human condition. You separate the two because uh, labor historically has always had a slightly different meaning than work. And part of that's in the presence of toil. Uh, Work doesn't entail toil, but labor does. And secondly, labor is, in every context, is at least in the Western tradition, interchangeable with the process that women go through when they give birth. And so you use both together for obvious reasons uh, as you think through the process. But it is that. It's a process. And so labor is really bound up in its nature as a process. It involves toil and reproduction and consumption and destruction of whatever the product is, and then repetition. So if you think of labor as working the land, you know, you're working the land and you're not done. You work the land, you know, you till it one time and you plant and you, you know, whatever, and then you harvest and then you consume the harvest and you have to go at it all again. It's a process and everything involves the destruction of the product. So you're, you don't produce wheat so that it can exist forever. Well, now we'll never need wheat again. You produce wheat, and then you consume the wheat. And when you consume it, it's gone. It's destroyed in its use. So the nature of labor is this process that can't end. Even the reproduction process in terms of the, you know, the race or the species. You, when you reproduce, you're reproducing so that they can reproduce and so that they can reproduce. And when people only think of labor, they do it, it does tend toward futility or vanity, or emptiness, or something like that, because it only seems to feed itself. You know, you're creating this whole process of exhaustion, and production, and then consumption, and destruction, 
just so you can start over again and do a bunch more work and get exhausted and then start producing something that you can then consume so that it's destroyed again. And what's the point? So the process of labor, though, I think, and I think this will be clear in the way uh, Scripture talks about it and, and, and in the role we play in the world, that it is an essential part of who we are as human beings, that we all participate in that kind of process that's, that, that is going to be endless. And it's not about what we leave behind. It's about us being a part of that process and producing and consuming and, and being the people who are in the middle of that process. And I'll talk more about it uh, uh, later. I mean, we'll, we'll get into some explanations that I think will make sense of that in terms of how we live out our Christian lives. But in contrast with that is work, not labor, but work. And the difference with work, and this is really, I mean, this is part of where I just really appreciate how clear on our it can be. You know, it's part part of the the reason you recognize the difference here is in the same way we can substitute the word labor in a context where we're talking about the work, quote, double quote, that people are doing. We can talk about it that way, but we can talk about it as a woman giving child, you know, having childbirth. Or we can talk about it as toil. You know, it's all of those things. That's how labor functions. In that same way, work is used equally about the work of a man's hands, you know, what he does, meaning he's applying his hands to doing something or a woman applying her hands to doing something. But we can also apply it to the work of their hands, meaning the thing they produced. That's the thing that's different about work from labor. Labor isn't about the product. You never call something the labor. You call something the work. This is the work of their hands. And so the work is a durable product. It's not automatically destroyed in its use. I mean, everything in the world that's material is destroyed eventually. That's not the point. It's that it's not destroyed in the nature of its use. I mean, sure, if you're Sammy Hagar, maybe you're destroying the guitar in the nature of its use, but that's not the nature of a guitar's use. You get the point. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm extending the argument too far. The point is that the work is the durable product, and the one that's most obvious is a work of art. That's the thing that is still done as work in our society that people still think of as this kind of work. And it is the nature of this kind of work is the durability of what comes of it. So it's like a, you know, a consumable would be destroyed in the labor cycle. So you produce wheat and then you eat it. This is not that. This is a piece of art that's created and you view it and it's still there. Lo and behold. And maybe you have to do some maintenance on it to keep it up or to keep it from being destroyed or whatever, but it's not naturally destroyed. That's why, by the way, this distinction, if you want to really understand the distinction, I'll give you clarity about the distinction by trying to confuse you. Because there, there, is some, there are points of overlapping. You know, there are points of confusion. But I think they actually help even clarify what the point of the distinction is. So that's why, for me, it's a little confusing emotionally, personally. When I mowed the yard, which is not my favorite thing to do, and then I think how sad it is that I'm going to need to do that in only three weeks again. <laughs> That's a joke. I won't wait three weeks. Not in reality. But I'd prefer to wait three weeks if I could. Anyway, the point is, you know, I just did the yard. It's perfect. It's pristine. And now I've just got to do it again. Well, on the one hand, what I'm doing is trying to create a little work of art a landscape to shape the world that people live in. Oh, look at this piece of art that's in front of their house or around their house. Isn't that nice? That's I'm thinking of it that way. But on the other hand, I'm sort of mimicking this historical tilling, keeping of the soil to expend my energy on one end and then consume the product of the land on the other end, which I have to do, by the way, by the money that I saved, by not spending paying someone else to do my yard, and then I go to the grocery store and buy the wheat somebody actually planted in the ground, thankfully, uh, to do that work. So in one sense, it, it really is just labor. It's a process. So inherently, I'm, I'm always going to need to mow the yard again because the work, the, the, the labor that we do with the ground is that kind of labor. Uh, but the way we think of it, I'm just, you know, crafting a landscape so that people can enjoy walking by my yard or so that I can enjoy seeing it from the porch which I would never sit on because it's covered with mosquitoes most of the time. Anyway, the point is, 
It's a little of both. But in understanding that it's a little of both, maybe it helps clarify the difference between the two. Third category, by the way, and I'll finish real quickly here for today, is action. Uh, and so there's labor work and then there's action. And I know we would think of it to ourselves, oh, I mean, action, wouldn't that just be labor or work? But, but that's not the point here. The point of action is what human beings do that entails interaction with other people. And so usually this is in the category of speech and action. Uh, in scripture, you see it as, uh, you know, deed, word and deed, uh, something like that. It's not just in your tongue, but also in your works, that kind of thing. So action. And it's basically interacting with others as human, and not, but, but, but not just like a pinball, not just like you, you saw other people and you reacted to them, but you did something with them because you're a human and they're a human. Uh, and the, the effect of it is, and I'm just saying this briefly so we can talk about it next time, but the effect of it is that we reshape the interactions that others have, that you've done something to sort of shift the way all the other things are going to happen. And, and, and it's a, a fundamental part of being human is, the, the, this is the weirdest thing, but it's a- absolutely the case. And we've talked about it in ethics discussions uh, in these episodes before. But a fundamental part of being human is that we are exactly like and completely distinct from every other human. It's just built into us. You, we, we know we're all the same thing, exactly the same thing. It's what makes us human. It's why we have that term. And yet we all know that we are completely distinct. Unique human beings in action, when we're talking about action, unique human beings bring speech or action, and those two are inherently tied together, bring speech or bring action to the community of all the humans. And obviously you don't do it at one moment. I'm going to go speak to 8 billion human beings or seven and a half or however many there are. I can't keep up. I, I mean, I can't even keep up with the number, much less all of them, but I do affect all of humanity when I affect some of the humans that I'm around. I interact with them. The difference in our being and doing, because I'm unique, I'm different from everyone else, that difference in our being and doing then makes a difference in humanity as a whole. And as it turns out, that's why God put us in the world. He didn't just create a mat of humanity and say, well, like the grass, just cover everything up, y'all. He created human beings beings that are all distinct from each other, even though we're all the same thing. And he expects each of us to shape all of us. And I think those three tools talking about, and by tools, I mean ways for us to examine what we're giving back to God from this world. They give us a way to look at ourselves and say, am I as the distinct being God made me? Am I laboring, working, and acting in the ways God intended in all those days that he gave to me? Am I acting? Am I working? Am I laboring in the ways God intended so that I could be a part of what he does to shape all of humanity? More next time. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. (laughs) Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.